Good day, I'm Ed Hyland, and today on Profiles, we're going to talk about terrorism. These days, it is a sad fact. We hear of almost daily terrorism. But the old saying, know thy neighbor and thy enemy, has really never been more true. Joining us today is Stephen Sloan. Professor Sloan is recognized as a specialist in terrorism studies at the University of Central Florida with a long career. Dr. Sloan is also co-author of numerous articles and books, including Terrorism, Assassins to Zealots. We'd like to welcome Dr. Sloan. Thanks so much for coming by and joining us. It's a pleasure today. being here today. L let's, let's talk about uh, you know, what you are imparting at this point at the University of Central Florida. Uh, someone walks into your class and, and you open the door and, and what are you saying to those students about terrorism and its status right now? Well, it's, it's really exciting being here, and uh, the students are very, very open, which helps. And basically, I, I try to focus it on initially to get them to understand the purposes of terrorism, the context in which it takes place. Most people understandably react emotionally to the imagery they see that's portrayed on the media. And that's again, is understandable, but one has to move beyond the emotional reaction, and if one understands the purposes, the tactics, and the strategies of terrorism, while you're still going to react to what you witness, if it's placed in the context, you probably won't overreact and you'll understand the nature of what's happening and what may happen in the future. So I spent a goodly amount of time dealing with the major characteristics of terrorism to get beyond simply the images and symbols of the carnage. But isn't that, at least to me, that's one of the, the purposes of terrorism is how we react and, and what we do and that's sometimes how they gauge how successful the terrorism act might be, how we react. I think that's very true. Uh, a, co a colleague of mine, Brian Jenkins, said many years ago, terrorism is a form of theater aimed at the people watching and I do in my own work refer to as the theater of the obscene because it's revolting in one sense, of course, but people are fascinated. It's almost like a, a car wreck. And the idea is to con convey a message of fear and intimidation to a, a larger audience. Sun Tzu, the ancient sage on warfare, had it beautifully. He said, kill one person and frighten a thousand. And now, of course, after the tragedy of 9-11 and beyond, you can say, kill almost 3,000 and fr frighten millions. And clearly, terrorism is a form of also what is called propaganda by the gun or armed propaganda. So you're quite right, the impact is very profound. Well, let's go back a little bit and talk about terrorism uh, as, as in history, if you will, yeah. and, and recent history. Uh, the earmarks were there. There were signs and acts of terrorism that took place, but it was always in another country. At least it seemed to be that way. It was always somewhere That's else. Right. It was somewhere else's backyard. And well, gee, that government or that uh, community must have been at fault for not recognizing it. And yet then it hit us, and we were also faulted for not recognizing it. It was very, very vexing, I must tell you, because back in the 70s, uh, I had a good fortune of having a number of wonderful students, and uh, I started to conduct a course on terrorism uh, at my old university, which was the first course on terrorism in the United States listed. And it was very frustrating because people had the view of terrorism is wh what happens to other people in other countries, and I never accepted that premise. Uh, clearly, uh, the borders, physically, psychologically, that we've witnessed, uh, meant that it was going to be coming to the United States. And with the initial World Trade Center, even then, the initial attacks, the reaction was, well, it happens on the east or west coast, but not in the heartland. And then finally, when, as you know, it happened in my old hometown, Oklahoma City, people understood or started to understand that terrorism ultimately happened to them. And in a sense, beyond that, and I really emphasize this, that in a real sense, terrorism, like Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local, all terrorism is local, because ultimately who's going to have to deal with that? Whether it's Oklahoma City or Dublin or Jerusalem, we all have to deal with that on a local level. So there's a, a heightened level of awareness, but we uh, still have a way to go. You raise an important point, and that's the fact that when we talk of terrorism, I think generally you think of the international community right. and international terrorists, but we have homegrown terrorism as well. You were there in Oklahoma City. In fact, uh, 10 blocks, I believe, you yeah. were from, from, from the building yeah. where all this, this took place. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you were among the first to actually suggest that, that um, everyone was talking at that time, oh, it must be an international incident. It must have been caused by someone of Middle Eastern descent. And you were among the first in the nation to, to actually say, no, let's sit back and think about 
other potential sources for this terrorism. Well, I think part of that was, <coughs> pardon me, the conventional wisdom that was coming from D.C., from those, quote, in the know. But part, quite frankly, was people didn't, didn't want to accept the premise, I think, that Americans could do that to Americans. Of course, we have a long history where we've done a job on ourselves. And then there was the danger, of course, of stereotyping. You know, it's always easier to lay uh, the finger of blame on someone who appears to be different. And uh, that was troublesome. And uh, <clears throat> if there was one thing that I was satisfied with, that I was at least to some degree able to negate that view. Because, as a friend of mine said many years ago, I thought about Bosnia. He says the first information you get is wrong. And this rush to judgment is something we have to be very, very, very careful uh, about. And there's always a, the rush to judgment, even if we don't have the information. And especially, I'd say, today, we, we try to bring analytic order into sense out of chaos, right, by explaining things even if we don't have all the information. And part of that is promoted, quite frankly, by conspiracy theories. And by the way, I must tell you, especially now with the second life of the Internet, because the Internet now, after you get the in initial impact on the mass media, creates uh, the chat rooms, an environment that gives each story its own unique shelf life. And so it's a real challenge to deal with the, with the longer impact of terrorism. And also gives potential terrorists another meeting ground, if you will, that they didn't have before. Cyberspace now becomes a place where you can, you can breed and, and recruit. It's a very significant area right now. Uh, my colleagues, uh, particularly out in the coast, talk about uh, net war and social net war, which doesn't simply deal with the impact of the Internet in terms of uh, you know, recruiting, in terms of getting messages across, in terms of now being able to maintain security and yet coordinate operations, as in the case of September 11th. But beyond that, it's all, also organizational, because internet organizations are small cells, right, which are tied together, whereas the classic response by governments is a classic ladder hierarchy. And the difficulty in that is you can't use a ladder hierarchy to combat these small cells. So it's also a profound challenge. Our response in the past, not simply the U.S., is when in doubt, throw money at the problem and make a larger bureaucracy. And unfortunately, what terrorists have done is using the Internet in a sense, they've engaged in a franchise process uh, where they can conduct local operations but get broader support and also have what's called deniability when they choose not to, to take credit for it. And it, it is a major, major problem because Terrorists, in many cases, have achieved a unity of purpose, haven't they, irrespective of their different groups. And what do we witness, for example, still today in terms of the U.S., the bureaucratic battles in regards to 9-11 reforms and turf battles in regards to the intelligence community, and uh, the need increasingly for more international cooperation, which is now happening. Has there been a very short learning curve for, for us, for the world, actually, when it comes to terrorism? In other words, terrorism's been around for a long time uh, in, in many different forms, but as we were talking about with the Internet and the ability of, of terrorists to, to get together in, in different ways, ways that were never possible 20, 30 years ago, uh, have we suddenly decided that there must be a different way to go about rooting out terrorists? Well, there's continuity and change. Uh, the continuity is terrorism has traditionally been a, a weapon of what's called asymmetric warfare, where in, in essence it's the war of the flea, where you try to negate the power of a much more powerful entity by indirectly attacking them. There's so many more targets. That's old. The issue of uh, armed propaganda, that's old too, although of course now it's increased, especially with the mass media and now a new effect with in terms of the internet. So those things are all uh, clearly uh, the, the profound impact of computers and the internet have changed things. But I must tell you quite candidly, uh, and it's not unique to me, you didn't, don't have to be a seer, there were a number of us who in the 70s were very concerned about what now is called WMD weapons of mass destruction, who were very, very concerned in terms of of attacks on the state and local level. And the issue on that is terrorists in many ways are very conventional, but they also have an imagination. Bureaucracies, with all due respect, 
uh, don't have imagination. And I think in one of the 9-11 reports, they, uh, the, the writers aptly said it was a failure of imagination to look at the world from the perspective of an adversary. They don't necessarily play by our rules, and we don't, we're starting to develop the capability, but we have a way to go yet. Bombs seem to be a favorite uh, method, but yes. with the September 11th attack, certainly we saw that planes, other yeah. vehicles could be used. Uh, as I recall, you were among the first who suggested that perhaps there was other methodologies that, that might be employed by the terrorists, and now we also have the additional worry of potentially the suitcase nuclear type weapons. But again, those have been there. Uh, I, I think the problem now, uh, among things, is that is twofold. One, uh, the readily ready availability of these or other weapons, whether uh, they are developed by the terrorists themselves or bought on the uh, on the gray and black market, because more and more of these are available. But I think what's equally and in many ways even more important, and the Arm Shinriko, the Japanese attack, or the sarin gas attack in Tokyo, was sort of the beginning of this is you now have groups, whether they're cults or fundamentalists, who don't care about public opinion. They want to see the system destroyed. And in many cases, if you talk about a suicide bomber, they're going to get their awards in the next life. So if they don't care about public opinion, there's no restraint in regards to the willingness to use the weapons. So it's a combination of the capability and the intent, which makes it even more dangerous today. Are you surprised we have not seen uh, a nuclear type attack? I uh, I worry about it, but I, I, I'll tell you, uh, certainly I do, but it's the old story. Uh, the most likely types of attacks still will remain the bombing and so forth, and we know what bombings can do. The impact, while we look at the nuclear, which is a very significant uh, reality to deal with, but look at something else. Look at what anthrax scares can do. Look how, how those closed down Congress and so forth. It and look what, for example, which was not a terrorist attack, what two snipers in Washington did to seize, to immobilize the district and have a profound impact, you know, within the country. So while we have to look at the, the future in terms of these other attacks, uh, let me tell you, these, quote, lower level attacks are, are, are methods of mass intimidation also. You seem to be painting almost a, a, a no-hope scenario, a, a we don't have much option here. No, I don't want to say that, uh, and I'm, I'm glad you raised that. Uh, terrorism is a form of protracted conflict. There is not going to be decis a decisive victory. We don't talk about uncondition unconditional victory anymore anyway since World War II. It, it will test the resolve of not only U.S., but other countries and uh, entities to work together, be they multinational corporations or NGOs. Uh, to work together co to, co to combat terrorists. The key on that, I think, on many levels is, one, the key role of intelligence, to identify and apprehend individuals before they go, quote, tactical, because quite frankly, once they go tactical, the movement to the target and the explosion, especially when you talk about WMD, no matter how good your response is, you could be overwhelmed. So as a colleague of mine said, from uh, another country a number of years ago, if there's a failure, it's a 90% failure, and that failure is intelligence. That is not simply uh, penetrating these organizations, which is very difficult. You have to have the area and language expertise. You also have, the, have to have the ability to analyze, <clears throat> and that's where education plays such a key role. Developing the international and area expertise and writing skills, as well as developing the technical capabilities to, com to combat terrorism. Uh, I'm not unduly pessimistic. The other thing, and it's, a, uh, it's an important line and a difficult line, is developing a level of awareness on the state and local level. Uh, I don't mean paranoia, and I, I, I get concerned about that, but when we talk about awareness, if we see strange people in our neighborhoods, we call it crime watch. And that's quite, quite right. You, don't, you see a car parked in a strange place, you should report it. All I'm talking about in terms of counterterrorism for, for people, and again, not paranoia, is crime watch with a certain kind of muscle. And, and that's important without creating paranoia. And it's important that people not overstate the threat, but not understate it. Because if, they, if we overstate the threat, you know what happens? People tend to turn off, right? It's like the boy who cried wolf. Mm -hmm. And if we understate it, they ignore it. 
you got to go beyond between orange and green warnings. Uh, it has to be have meaning to people. It has to be, in a sense, what's called actionable. So people can get some advice as to what to do. And the last thing I would say on it, because you raise a, a very interesting question in terms of intelligence, we have the unique problem is that we're talking about secret intelligence. How do you reconcile the need for secret intelligence with the rights uh, of individuals in terms of their basic civil liberties? That is, will always be a delicate balance. And terrorists know that and will look to test the uh, U.S. and other democratic systems to see if they'll overreact. It, it would seem, based on history over the last, actually over the last 10 years or so, that intelligence has not exactly been our, our, uh, our forte. We've had problems with that flow of intelligence from the source, meaning the groups that may be plotting and planning different things, and getting it to the people who could pretend, potentially take some type of action to, to thwart uh, th those groups. It has been a major problem. First of all, targeting terrorist groups as a source of intelligence is very difficult. They're small, clandestine, cell-like organizations often embedded in, in different cultures, uh, difficult to penetrate because people come from the same family or clan or extended family. But in the context, particularly the U.S., we've relied so heavily, heavily on what is called technical intelligence, satellites, uh, remarkable things that we can do in terms of ELINT, electronic intercepts, and so forth. But you cannot deal with the intentions or capabilities of two people speaking in a safe house in Milan. You have to have to be there. And that requires what is called human intelligence, or human, to develop the cap capability to have people who can go in that environment and run agents, it's very dangerous, who can penetrate these organizations. In a sense, I'm saying we've been technologically, in a sense, muscle-bound. And the other aspect of that, and you're quite right on it, and I think the 9-11 report uh, particularly is, is a useful one. The turf battles, quite frankly, had, and I teach a course on intelligence, and I've worked uh, 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 and consulted in this area, uh, when you get turf battles uh, between different entities within the so-called intelligence community, or you have the inherent tensions, I'm going back, between the FBI uh, who treated terrorism as a law enforcement problem domestically and the CIA who viewed it as a national security is in the I issue in the context of collecting information, not for court, but for evidence, you had intense competition. And as a friend of mine, may rest in peace, John O'Neill, who was the man who warned us about this, uh, he talked about the other aspect. What we're dealing with now is seamless terrorism, where the line between foreign and domestic is blurred, and where the line between uh, domestic response, regional and international response is being blurred. So we really have a, a way to go yet, and quite frankly, uh, the idea of having a new intelligence czar, which we're going to have, is a very positive thing. It's about time. But he or she, the question will still be, will they have the vision and political clout to carry on? And will, and this is a major issue since 80% of the intelligence funding still goes to DOD, who will, who will control the budget? And this will not be an easy issue to deal because we're dealing with different people, highly dedicated, with different cultures, and there's nothing like an intelligence culture of a secret organization or one who perceives itself to be one. We got a long way to go on this, plus what do you deal in terms of homeland security? A massive, massive organization. How do you deal with the issue of organization, right, and unity of effort, and how do you relate that to getting important work down to the state and local level without compromising what are called sources and methods. It's a very complicated issue. Do you think the world of terrorism has forever changed our uh, personal liberties in this country? In other words, are, are we going to have to compromise to be able to deal with terrorists on, on the international and domestic front? I, 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 I think to a degree, yes, because the level of technology, the threat out there is more significant in some ways, but I'm always reminded of two things in American history. The Civil War we had basically under Lincoln what was called, you know, a constitutional dictatorship, uh, uh, the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus and so forth. In World War II we had uh, what has often been called crisis government, where a democracy, right, when responding to major crises, right, can pass certain kinds of measures which are not going to be used in peacetime. However, the catch-22 on is once those measures are out there, 
even if peace returns, how much of the legacy of those remain? And if you're dealing with what we now perceive to be a protracted war, I am concerned that we may see, what, a gradual erosion of civil liberties, particularly in the context, and I understand this, this is difficult, of what is called a surveillance society. I mean, it's good, for example, to see all these TV cameras in terms of traffic. But if we emulate increasingly what we have in the British system, we have TV cameras everywhere. Mm -hmm. They're great in terms of fighting crime, but you know, it invades your right to privacy in terms of being on the screen. And these raise fundamental issues in the future in terms of what is called the private zone of you and me in an increasingly intrusive society. We've seen that with the recognition software that's being used, tested in this country, yes. used in Britain. Yes. Uh, uh, some of the x-ray type machines that are yeah. being used, which essentially bears everything to the x-ray. And, and on one hand, you see, oh, this is necessary. We have to be able to find the bomb or the device that may be on that person, or perhaps recognize the terrorist who's walking in that crowd of people. On the other hand, you're right. There's people there who perhaps may not want to be photographed for reasons only because they don't want to be on camera. Uh, I, I, and you know, the only analogy I could give to it, it gives you a little taste of it. If you've ever been to Las Vegas, you'll see in every mm -hmm. casino, right, these eyes in the sky. Now, multiply that into the millions, and that's what we're seeing in the U U.S. now. And it's going to be a very, very, very difficult line to deal with, because again, our private zone is being under a technological assault. And I don't have any easy answer for that. It's one of the issues we deal with, by the way, in my course on terrorism. Well, let's talk about some of the positives then. And yeah, of course. Hopefully there are some yes, here. Yes, there certainly because, are. Because, uh, you know, we have this, this very dire situation that we're dealing with, a basically on a, a daily situation, yet you have students, you have people coming in, you're talking about it, it's out in the open. Does that help? Is there a positive side? I think there is. Uh, as my students, and I really thoroughly enjoy this group of students down here, uh, as I've done in the past, as they learn about the nature of terrorism, they convey that message to their family and their friends, et cetera, in their own way. And as such, knowing, understanding it, God forbid something happens in many instances, they're there to help people understand the nature instead of automatically, intrinsically overreacting. In essence, that's an aspect of continuing education where my students, for example, are educating their parents, just like my daughter has educated me. And your daughter is clearly yes, educating you, too. <laughs> but uh, beyond that, you raise other issues, and I want to emphasize this. Uh, we've been, and I go, knock wood, very fortunate that we haven't been confronted at this time. That's not simply accidental. That's the effect of good intelligence. And that's the catch-22. In terms of good counterterrorism, right, success is measured when something doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to advertise that success because you don't want to reveal, again, your sources and methods. We have been successful. I just came back this summer from uh, an extraordinary opportunity for me, which was to helping to uh, teach in the first iteration of a new course at the George C. Marshall European Sec uh, Center for European Security, which is run by the U.S. and Germany, but basically it's under the whole NATO environment. We had NATO and non-NATO individuals. Uh, in my own seminar, I had people from Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Israel, Albania, Romania, the U.S. And you know, once you got beyond the usual rhetoric, and these were the young men and women who are in key positions, will be the future leaders, once you stripped away the rhetoric, what struck you is their professional commitment to work together to make sure that innocent people weren't killed. And the key on that, and I want to throw that, is it's developing those informal networks among people who share the same values. We are not simply going up and down ladder hierarchies. You pick up a phone and say, look, we're having a little problem here. Can you give me some insight? Also, it ties together, makes for what? Not only professional associations, but very positive associations. And I must tell you, uh, since you raised that question, the thing uh, that I like about this, and I know my colleague uh, John Bercio mentioned this at a previous thing, is the issue of mentoring. I, I'm so proud. I have former students of mine, because I've been out of them 40 years, uh, 
I started when I was five. <laughs> but uh, I have four former students of mine who are now in senior positions within the government and other places, and they're hiring my other students. And I have young students now who are now in crucial positions at the age of 28, 29, 30 at the forefront. And, and, and 10 years ago, they were taking my class. And, and that's what it's all about. And so what I'm suggesting is, I think we're learning a great, great deal. And I think beyond that, uh, the whole thrust of international education and awareness can indeed break down the stereotypes and the ignorance that in so many ways stokes the fires of extremism. Because I do really believe education ultimately is a liberating force in the best possible way. So we're creating our own network, if you will, which has the potential to counteract a terrorist network. Uh, yes, and, 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 I, and I find, again, uh, and I'd like to get down to the level of the students, because they're, you know, they're, they're the most educable of all. I mean, you know, they're young, they're open, and I'm talking about high school students, too. Once they start meeting people from other countries, of course there'll be misunderstandings, but you know, I'm struck particularly, I did a program a number of years ago called Semester of Sea, where I went around the world uh, with 600 students. It was wonderful seeing the way teenage, what teenagers. What a field trip, yes. But the way teenagers could strip through all the stuff very, very quickly, whether in Vietnam or Malaysia or in China, and with other teenagers or college kids, open up the conversation without intellectual pretense. They shared one heck of a lot. And that also deals with the issue of terrorism. And th what I should say, too, is one of the reasons you should understand terrorism and conflict of warfare, you can't understand the nature of peacekeeping or peace unless you understand the nature of war. And so you've got to do both. And the great peacekeepers, by the way, were very knowledgeable on the nature of war because they tried to neutralize it. Nonviolent resistance, Martin Luther King and Gandhi. And they, the peacekeepers knew the other side of the coin, the violence, and paid the price for it, but were very successful in many ways. Well, certainly if you can end a discussion of terrorism on a positive note, that is the place to end it. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Stephen Sloan, for coming by and joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. And once again, that is another program of Profiles. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ed Hyland. Until next time.